let us seek a 10 minute game. We're 1831, so moving right along and playing 1868 with white. Yeah, we're gonna go with the D4. We're gonna go more positional. We're gonna go more positional. And he goes G6. So this is either a Grunfeld or a King's Indian. Okay, Knight C3. Okay, so this is our first Grunfeld. I don't think we faced a Grunfeld uh, with the white pieces. It really is, it only becomes, I would say, truly popular at the level of, um, at the level of 18, 18 1900. Um, and white has a bajillion options against the Kronfeld. And they're all, n nothing has been proven to get an advantage. I'll put it this way. Um, and I'm just trying to think of like a system that might be easy to play. Um, one system that sort of flies under the radar a little bit, uh, particularly at this level when people are often just learning the Grunfeld, is to refrain from taking on d5 um, and instead... Oh, actually, no, I know what, I know what to play. I know what to play. Um, we're going to take. We are going to take. And in the Grunfeld, there's a lot of very offbeat, very offbeat systems that are actually not that bad and that can give you an advantage... Um, if black is not precise. And one of the rarest moves available in this position, this is a move that you will not come up with in a million years. And not because you're um, not because you're bad, but just because it's it's pretty crazy, is knight a4. Whoa, bandit ad with the 10 gifted. Thank you. Damn girl. Thank you for the 10 gifted bandit ad. Alright. So he goes e5. I'm very surprised that he actually knows this move. Now, the purpose of knight a4, I'll talk more about this after the game, but the, perp the main purpose is to prevent him from being able to take my knight in response to e4. So I want to play e4 and chase his knight away. So it makes sense from that perspective. And in order to do that, you have to move your knight. Now he goes e5. This is the main line. This is uh, the sacrifice is a pawn and gets an initiative in return. As far as I remember, we're supposed to take this pawn. And then he gives me like a check on b4. We block with bishop d2, and then I don't remember the rest. Let's see how this goes. Um, bishop b4 check. We have to cover the check. Yeah, knight e3 is a move. Um, so I'm very surprised that he knows this line. Very surprised. Uh, because this is, as far as I know, this is not that well known. Now, he sacrifices a knight temporarily, but he's going to win the knight back on a4. He's going to win the knight back on a4. As you guys will see, this knight on a4 is going to be undefended after he takes on d2. And then he's going to go queen h4, queen takes a4. So it takes. He has to... Oh, and I think he just confused the move order. I think he just confused the move order. I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty sure that you have to take the bishop first. Because here's the thing. When you take the bishop, I have to take with the queen. Then you give a check on h4, and it forks the king and the knight. But... There's a subtle difference here in that I can play g3. He takes my bishop. What's the difference? I, I, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong. Or maybe this is still theory, but I don't think so. We can take with the king, and the queen still defends the knight. So that's the danger of trying to, you know, overly parrot a repertoire that you learned. Uh, you confuse one little thing in these very topical openings, and immediately you're, you're losing. Uh, and our queen defends the knight. Now, isn't it dangerous that our king is in the center? Not really, because the king is going to tuck itself away on c1. So it's not actually dangerous that our king is in the center. He doesn't have any pieces out. He gives me a check on b4. Some of you might be tempted to cover this with a knight. That would be a very bad blunder because of queen takes b2 check. Uh, so we've got to be very precise here. And there's no reason, as far as I can tell, not to go king c1, tuck the king away. And then quickly we need to develop our pieces. See, that's what some people... Uh, that's what derails some people in these positions. You start, um, sh you know, you start various shenanigans. No shenanigans, you just got to develop your pieces, consolidate the advantage, and then you're up a piece. White has some difficulty because we've got Irish pawns. We don't have the king side developed. We've got some stuff that we need to solve. Um, but we'll solve it. He doesn't have his pieces developed either. So yeah, move orders are crucial. Move orders are absolutely crucial. And when you're studying an opening... If there is a sequence like this, you've got to make sure you're establishing why the move order is, whether the move order is important and why it's important if it is. Because that will help you avoid these kinds of mistakes, which happen pretty often.
Bishop f5 he can play, but there's no threat. I mean, we just develop our knight to c3. So it's no, it's no issues. It's not weird at all. People forget and confuse stuff all the time. It's it's not 100% totally understandable that he confused the line. Grunfeld is very theoretical. Okay, so obviously here we're just going to have f3. Okay, queen takes c3 check. Doesn't help his cause at all. We can just block with our queen. And in a sense, this helps us. Because now if we move this pawn out to e4, the bishop will be open. 300 bits, thank you. So what should we do now? Should we go e3? No, we should definitely not go e3. It blunders both of our knights. We should instead drop our knight back to c3, just very simple. And now we can move in for the kill. So we've got two separate ways to win a position like this. We can do it through the trading method. We can go queen up to d5 and basically force the queen trade. I don't like that because that's a, it seems a little bit too... I don't know how to define it. It just We don't need to do that because now we have a lead in development. So there's absolutely no need uh, to go out of our way to uh, to to trade the queens. Knight d4 would blunder the rook. So from that perspective, we can fianchetto our bishop. That's a great idea. Another great idea is to prepare the development of the bishop via this diagonal. And how can we do that? Yeah, we can go e4. And the reason I like this move uh, on top of uh, what I just said is that it threatens the pin. It, it goads him into castling. And I had seen that we have a very strong move here. And the way that you guys should see this move is to recognize that he lacks his Grunfeld bishop. He lacks a Fianchetto bishop. When you lack a Fianchetto bishop, these dark squares around the kings uh, around the king are incredibly weak. And there's a, a bunch of very thematic ideas that stem directly from that. And one of them, of course, is to put the queen on h6 and follow it up with a devastating knight g5. So he has to push his f-pawn out to stop me from doing that. In turn, that creates other weaknesses. Um, that creates other weaknesses, which we're going to explain. In particular, it creates the weakness of... Sorry creates the weakness of this diagonal. So if we put a bishop on c4, that's going to be checkmate. Okay, so he finds f6 to his credit. And how do we approach the question of actually finishing this one off? Um, well, like I said, if we could put a bishop on c4, that would be devastating. Okay, so do we go b3 here to prepare it? Well, that would be a bad idea because that would blunder the knight. So instead we need to go at it from the opposite end opposite angle can we chase the queen away from c6 in order to pave the way for bishop c4 that needs to be done a little bit carefully um so how can we do that how can we go about doing that well knight d5 the knight is pinned the knight is pinned guys so you keep trying to put stuff on d5 and see where you need to chase the queen away you need to chase the queen away you can do that in two different ways i love knight d4 but I also love the move bishop b5 because this develops the bishop simultaneously, so it's a helpful move. And we're trying to get the queen off of its control of c4. That's the bottom line here. But if that doesn't happen, then guess what? We could do worse than just having developed our bishop. That's a good thing. Okay, queen c5 is a good move. So he continues to stop us from coming bishop c4. But now asking ourselves how the position has changed as a result of the last two moves. Well, now we, we, can, we can continue the idea that we started with queen h6. So um, now that we've displaced his queen from its protection of the f6 pawn, we can, we can continue the idea that we started. Now we need to get a knight to g5, that was the idea. Now, should we do that immediately? Well, no, he's got the pawn on f6. So we take first, we give him the f file, so if we didn't have knight g5, this wouldn't have been a good idea. There would, there would have been no need to give him more concessions, but we're going directly for the kill here. He's got to check on e3. It's not dangerous. We can just tuck our king away on b1. Um, queen back to e7, and now we can actually move in for the kill. So let's be careful. Um, what should we do? Yeah, knight d5 is the simplest. He can come back to c5 with check, but easily it's easy to see that king b1 defends against all of the checks and creates insurmountable threats against his king so this is mate this is made and this is winning yeah yeah this is over I mean, this was a pretty easy game given that he blundered the piece. He helped us, but 
but yeah. I guess this guy has the Chessable Repertoire though, which is good. Svidler released a Grunfeld Repertoire. Yeah, guys, I'll answer the questions after the game as I always do. More YouTube videos are coming out every day on the speedrun. I'll just throw this out there. If you enjoy the speedrun content, it really helps grow my channel. If you subscribe to my YouTube, I appreciate each and every sub. We're trying to move toward 200K subs. So it would be a dream if we could, uh, if we could hit that. So we had a Grunfeld. And uh, the Smooth Knight A4 is incredibly rare. But nowadays, nothing truly is rare. Everything's been analyzed, everything is known. Um, and so these kind of like surprising moves are, are actually not, they just don't have the same, they don't have the same effect that they used to a couple of years ago. Uh, and Knight A4 was first played, I think it's called the Nadanian variation. There's this Armenian GM who played this often. He wasn't surprised, I mean, this guy, but he, yeah, it, it, this has over a thousand games at this point. Nakamura played it against Nepo. 1997, first time it was played. Thank you, the Grand Elixir with two subs. Appreciate it. And it was, no, sorry, no, 1995. And Ashot Nadanyan played it in 96 twice and beat Var Janakobian. And Var actually knew, Var played E5 in Bishop E4 in 1996. Only the second time this appeared, Var found this over the board. Uh, and again, so what is the point of Knight A4? What is the purpose of this? So let's say black plays normally. Let's say black plays bishop g7. White plays e4. And generally in the Grunfeld, black takes on c3 at this moment. So if you play a main line, okay, if you play e4, black takes on c3. And this creates sort of a pawn chain that black later attacks with a move c5. And that formulates the basis of the whole setup behind the Grunfeld. Black attacks white center. Uh, by developing the pieces and channeling them toward white center. How does knight a4 not allow that? Like, why can't black just... Okay, so you can drop to b6. What's the, bi what's the big deal here? Why is this, like, supposed to be good for white? So the point is that after... So white plays bishop b3. Um, that's the main move. And this creates a funny situation. Because this knight on a4, which looks bad, is actually stopping black from going c5. And this makes it harder for black to assail white's pawn center. Um, so for instance, if black castles, white goes knight f3. And now if black decides to take, the queen on a4 is, is very, very good. It's protecting the d4 a pawn from the side. White is al already, you know, has a small lead in development. And um, I think the main line goes c5 and now rook to d1. White gets the pieces out super quickly. And even though black is able to cut into white's center, uh, it's not good enough because white gets this big lead in development. The d-file uh, is under control. So I think white's supposed to be slightly better here. I, I, I haven't reviewed this in a while. CD knight d4. I see Svidler plays this, played this with black against Zhang though. Thanks for another gift and sub. So maybe white is only slightly better, but you guys can see kind of the point. The point is to disallow knight takes c3. Okay, so e4, knight b6, uh, bishop b3 is the main line. He played e5, which... Uh, which is the sharp move immediately exploiting the fact that white has made a move to the side. This follows the rules. You know, you meet a move to the side of the board with a move in the center. Uh, E5, D5, it's a very concrete idea. Bishop B4, now Knight E3. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, no, 2023, it's a good surprise weapon still. And I think this is supposed to be equal. I don't think white is worse in this line. And again, the whole point is that you ruin white's pawn structure. Now you're supposed to take the bishop and then fork the king and the knight with queen h4. g3, queen takes a4. And you get this very interesting, very unbalanced position where technically white is up a pawn, yes. However, you've got Irish pawns. You've got sort of a permanently weak king. Even if white manages to castle kingside, white's got g3. Black, on the other hand, also has a permanently weakened kingside. So both sides, kings, are in some trouble. I don't know how the theory goes here. I have no idea what white's main move in this position is. I can check. Uh, so apparently, white's main move in this position, let me just check one second. Yeah, so apparently, bishop g2 would be natural, fianchettoing the bishop or knight f3. Bishop g2, 25 games, castles. Yeah, knight f3, knight c6, castles, bishop g4, something to this effect. So this is about equal, bishop g2, 
Um, castles, knight f3, knight c6, castles, bishop g4, both sides complete their development. Black is probably going to win back the pawn. I'm checking with mega base, yeah. So, you know, interesting line. Svidler apparently gives us in his repertoire. But queen h4 check is a confusion of the move order that costs him the game. Because g3, bishop d2, and now of course king takes d2. And don't assume that your opponent knows everything. If your opponent is blitzing out the moves, I see a lot of players trusting the opponent, thinking, oh, well, my opponent must have known, must know this, he must have reviewed the chessable repertoire. Uh, everyone you play is human, unless they're cheating. And so humans are prone to confusing openings all the time. I confused, I've, I have many stories of confusing move orders and confusing uh, positions in my preparation, even in, in over the board games against very high rated grandmasters. So, uh, you know, I can even give you one story if you think, oh, it's, you know, who is this guy? Why is he confusing the move order? How can that happen? It happens all the time at every level, particularly at the highest level when you have to memorize just a, a great deal of uh, theory just to stay alive. Um, so I wouldn't be too critical of people for forgetting stuff and confusing stuff. You've got to hold things in your mind. Um, You've got to hold a great deal of things in your mind. So let me, let me see if I can find this game. This was one of my like craziest examples of confusing my prep, even though I didn't get punished for it. So, and I'll have to use Stockfish here to just refresh my memory of like where, what the actual prep was. All right, so, so this was a tournament in Qatar. I've, I've shown my game with Kramnik from that tournament. This was like the strongest open tournament ever held. And I really wanted to do well. I did do well in both of the times that I played there. The second time Magnus played in that tournament, I didn't play him, but pretty, pretty crazy stuff. Um, and so halfway into the tournament, I'm playing Chinese Grandmaster Li Chao, who is 2750 FIDE rating. This is three rounds before the end. And okay, so he, he plays the Slav pretty exclusively. So I prepared for three hours. I prepared, prepared, prepared. Um, and, and because he kept playing into this one line, this gambit line, where he accepts a pawn sacrifice that's supposed to be bad for black, but of course he has his own analysis and stuff. So I, I set, stayed up all night analyzing. Uh, I was kind of tired when I came to the board. Um, but still, he went exactly into my preparation. And um, then disaster could have struck. So this is... Okay, I'll show you guys the whole game. So there was a, this was a Slav... Um, this was a Slav classical line. Now, Li Chao goes bishop g6 here. And after e4, I mean, you can decline the pawn sacrifice with castles, but Li Chao always took the pawn. And this is supposed to be extremely dangerous because after bishop a3, uh, I prevent him from castling. This is this sacrifice is another pawn, but this pawn is basically untouchable due to queen b2, um, as far as I remember. And this is a devastating fork. So queen c7... Uh, is 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 uh, Black's main move. This is theory, and so we get this critical position. A6 is the move, uh, and all of these moves have reasons behind them. I won't delve into them too deeply. Uh, the point behind A6 is that Black wants to play C5 in order to sever the connection between the bishop and the square. So Black wants to ensure that he can castle, and castling long is too dangerous because of the open B file. So the reason he plays A6 is to cover the B5 square because if you go C5 immediately, there's Bishop B5 with very unpleasant consequences along the diagonal. So a6, and I analyzed this position for a long time. I thought it might happen, it did. And I came up with a novelty, and the novelty is h3. And this is some computer stuff. Um, it's basically a waiting move, because it turns out that c5 here is inaccurate because white has the move d5 with a big initiative. Um, and this is one of the things that I analyzed. So in order to keep a playable position, black has to go knight e to f6. I have to drop the knight back, then I go knight e5, then you go c5, and this is the main line of my preparation. Knight d7, knight d7, and here I was very proud of myself for finding this move h4 with a computer. h4, and the point is that if he goes h6 or h5 to create some look for his bishop, could somebody tell me white's best move? This was my preparation, yeah. And I was very, I was like, man, I'm, if this happens, I'm gonna be Really happy. This guy's 2750. Yeah, bishop b6 because the bishop on g6 is now weak. And of course he can't take. So he's supposed to castle here. And you get risk-free position up a pawn for white. Black should probably be able to draw this. But I think, you know, 
you could do worse than having a risk-free position against the 2750. Um, okay, so this all happens, but Li Chao goes c5. And in my fatigue I, and, and anxiety, I accidentally, I confused the line of knight ef6 with the line from c5 and I played knight e5. So I, I played the move I was supposed to play only against knight e to f6. And the moment I released the knight and pressed the clock, I was like, something, you know, something feels wrong when you, you can tell something feels wrong. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He takes my knight, d takes e5, and he just castles, and white is completely lost. I'm down a pawn, I'm about to lose another one, and the knight on e4 cannot be trapped. Because if you go f3, then the knight swoops into g3 and then back out to f5. Why, this is minus 1.5, this position. White can basically resign against somebody like him. And I was, I mean, I was raging so hard on the inside. It was awful because of how much time I'd spent. And he thought for maybe 5, 10 minutes, and to my utter relief, he played knight e to f6. He went back into the line. And so I took and I played h4, um, and I got a big advantage. I was winning, and unfortunately, I failed to convert. But incredibly this was a very vivid story of confusing the prep and getting incredibly lucky he also probably confused it um so he probably thought or he thought that this was some deep prep and he was afraid to go for the obvious line but it, it ended up transposing um i had another story of confusing the prep, and i have many stories of confusing prep oh yeah well i told you guys the story in the very same tournament that in the very same tournament, two rounds later, sorry, in the very same tournament, tomorrow, the, the day after this game, I'm playing another 2700, Dmitry Yakovenko, I be, who, whom I beat um, a year or so before that in, in the World Team Championship. So he's got a chip on his shoulder. I've got a chip on my shoulder. I don't want to lose to him. I don't want to you know, lose to him after beating him. So the day after this misfortune happens, another crazy thing happens. Um, and I've, I've told this story before. So, but it's worth telling again. Okay, so I play Yakovenko. I play Yakovenko. And he's 27, 37. I'm black. I'm like, ah, oh, this guy. This is nasty stuff. So this was a relatively normal game until crazy stuff happened. So this was a Catalan. Whatever. Catalan, Catalan, Catalan. Normal stuff. I mean, he's got a slight advantage. Whatever. I've got a decent position. Got my knight to an outpost. It's a very complicated playable position. So he goes rook c2. He tries to double on c1. I'm like, okay. Um, so I was worried about rook a c1, right? Attacking the c6 pawn. So I quickly played f6. Never play f6. I played f6. Pressed the clock. At this point, my friend uh, Fedoseev came over. We sort of shook hands. Um, how are you doing? You know, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with my position at this point. But, you know, two seconds later, I look back at the board and I'm like, wait a second. Oh my God, I just made a terrible blunder. And it, it's an even worse feeling than, than I had the day before that. Because what does white have in this position? This is like a most elementary tactic of all time. How can you play a move like f6, weaken a pawn on e6 like this, and then not see that white has knight takes c6, um and the game is over because here's how the line goes now you can take with a rook it doesn't matter uh let's say you take with a rook he takes 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 e6 forking winning another pawn and winning the and winning back the bishop king h8 queen takes e6 now it seems like black goes queen d4 and maybe everything is fine you're seemingly forking the rook and the bishop but white has the very strong move rook a2 and th th this is actually totally losing B white is up a pawn a6 is saying white's got the two bishops, black's king is in ruins. This is totally losing. And I mean, I wouldn't have resigned, but the game would have would have been a loss. But after about two, three minutes of thinking, he played knight d3. And the way that I dealt with this is I actually got up from, I got up from the board. Um, I got up from the board because I couldn't look at it. I, I felt like he would read my mind. I thought in the slim chance that he would miss this, uh, that chance would be magnified if I didn't show anything on my face and pretended that everything was fine. And to my amazement, when I came back, he'd played knight d3. 
and uh, the game went on and I managed to make a draw. So <laughs> the game amazingly ended in, in a draw. So I got lucky twice in this tournament. Um, and I was thrilled at the way this tournament ended. The last round I drew for the Um So there's this question, how, did a 20, how could a 2700 miss something like this? And the reality is that you have a very small sample size. He probably see, sees 49 out of 50 of these tactics. This was the 50th. So people think of 2700s as robots. They're very much human. Um, a lot of stuff is missed. Oftentimes, when you have a blunder this elementary, 2700s are not used to having to punish such a blunder because these blunders are not made against them very often, right? I don't make blunders like this almost ever. So they're not in the mode of like, oh, my opponent just blundered this super elementary tactic. They're not even looking for that a lot of the time. I think that has to play a role in it. Um, but, but, this, but this stuff happened and this is only the tip of the iceberg. No, 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 no. There is no way he got scared of it. If he saw this move, he would have played it for sure. He ju it just slipped his mind. I mean, it just, it just fell out of his field of vision. I've never lost by, by forfeit. No, I've never, never not shown up to a game. I think he thought for a couple of minutes, but probably he was deciding between knight f3 and knight d3. I honestly think he just didn't, it just didn't occur to him. Um, and then after the tournament, he came up to me and he was like, oh my goodness. Like, how could I have not seen that? So he definitely missed it. He, we, we talked afterward. And he was incredibly upset during after the game too because he was he was much better later on. I I, I drew by the skin of my teeth. Uh, so he's old. Uh, he, how old was he? 30, 34, 30, 33 at the time. Uh, what should I have played? Um, I mean, black is worse. Black is worse, but uh, you know I can play maybe like knight b six, knight c four would be an idea. This is what I played afterward. Oh, sorry, no, 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 knight here, sorry. Yeah, I mean, even here, knight b6, maybe, and knight c4. Yeah, maybe something like this, try, trying to intercept the attack on c6. I don't know. This is seems pretty playable for black. But anyways, um, so that's that. That's that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, I've never forfeited a game. I've been late a couple of times, but I'm usually not late to, to chess games. Hope you guys enjoyed the story. Well, there have been plenty of games with even missed minute one. I mean, Vladimir Kramnik, Vladimir Kramnik very famously, um, very famously blundered made in one against uh, Fritz. And people, people's reaction was the same. How could a world champion blunder made? And the people who are saying that are not realizing that this is one game out of thousands that this guy has played. Something crazy is going to happen to any human. Doesn't matter how good he is at anything. And I think there's a little bit of idolization that goes on of the top guys uh, in recent times where people assume that they're never capable of elementary mistakes. That's not true. They're very, cap very much capable of elementary mistakes. Um, also, the pressure adds up and stuff. Yeah, so this was a very famous game. And when this happened, this was a huge, this went viral. So Vladimir Kramnik in 2006 was playing Fritz which back then was just about as good as Kramnik. They were playing on equal terms. They were drawing. And in this position, this was televised, I think, although I don't think there's a tape of this now anymore. So Kramnik uh, goes queen e3 and he gets up for a missed chair. And he walks to get water. And the operator right there was Fritz. And then there's the operator who makes the moves that the computer is indicating. The operator visibly was shocked. Like he could, he, even he saw that there was mate without Fritz's help. And uh, after queen h7, Kramnik was flabbergasted. After the simple king g8, the game should have ended in a draw. Uh, this is a dynamically equal position. But Kramnik misses made in one, just one of a kind, one, one out of a million kind of game. Um, so anyways. Yeah, we're all human. That's, that's the takeaway from that speedrun game. No, I mean, I, this was very famous. This is, if, if you had seen this, you would have remembered it too. So, no, my memory is not particularly, not particularly good. This is just, this was a very famous game. I can show you a million examples of like one move blunders at a high level that I was witness to myself. Uh, there was Inarchiev against Backrow, which I was watching. I was watching this game live. 
Um, this was a game between two Super GMs in 2008. Uh, Ernesto Etienne Bacro, French Super GM, and Ernesto Inarkiev. Uh Just both really, really strong players. And okay, they, they had a really interesting game, so I was watching the tournament uh, as it was going on. And there was a live feed. There was a live feed. Um, and in this position, Bacro has sacrificed an exchange. He's worse. Sir Sellers, thank you for the prime. But he's not losing. I mean, this is playable. And very famously, uh, well, I don't think this is as well known, but Bacro played queen e7 check. Obviously, wondering the queen. And he resigned before black moved. I mean, he immediately noticed it. Yeah, I should do a compilation of Botez Gambits and among 2,700 plus opponents. Anyways, um, this is a classical game. Yeah, yeah, this was this was uh, Fide Grand Prix. This was classical game. He had time. It just happens. So my theory again is that people who watch this and say, "How could this have happened?" You know, what a disgrace, you know, 2,700 blunders queen. Oh my God, why are they invited? They should never invite him to another tournament. They're, they haven't seen any, any other of their, that person's games and they just assume, oh, well, this must happen all the time. And it happens very rarely, but in the grand scheme of things, it happens a lot. I mean, if you take millions and millions of games, you're gonna have a lot of them that have one move blunders. This is still, you know, per, on a per capita level, this is almost nothing. On a, global basis this is a lot so anyways um we'll talk more about that later i gotta go i gotta go so thank you everybody this was a very fun stream the sorry the play wasn't was not great today uh but the play wasn't great today but uh i i still had a good time so we'll try to play better tomorrow i'll be back i will try to uh try to maybe do a morning stream tomorrow uh we'll see I don't know if I'll manage. I have a 10 a.m. lesson tomorrow, so I might stream from 11 Eastern to two, something like that. And then maybe again in the evening, <clears throat> in the evening. So we'll see. I'll see if I can squeeze, squeeze some good stuff in tomorrow. Thank you for hanging out, everybody. Hope you had a good time. I'll do more speed running, more educational stuff tomorrow together with hopefully better blitz. Hope everyone's had a good Saturday. Have a great rest of your Saturday. I'll see you guys later. Take care, everybody. Let me see who I can raid. Um, I will raid... Um, I'll raid Thirsty Monster. Yeah, I'll, I'll give Thirsty Monster a raid. He's raided me many, many times. He's a very talented young player and streamer. Enjoy your stream. Take care, everybody. Have a good time. See you guys tomorrow. Bye.